Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome back to this session on uh, compressive sensing and uh, rolling shutter. Uh, the first talk is uh, titled Flutter Shutter Video Camera for Compressive Sensing of Videos. And uh, Jason will give the talk. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> is the uh, sound OK? Everybody's happy? All right. Uh, thank you. My name is Jason. And uh, I'm going to be presenting our work on behalf of our collaborators, uh, Ashwin Ashok and Salil. And what we did is we are interested in taking a high-speed video, but only using a low-speed camera to do it. And what we're hoping is that by doing this, we're going to be able to avoid some of the problems inherent to using a high-speed camera. So first, let's talk about what it means to take an image. So here I have a, my low-speed camera, and I'm taking a picture of, of this scene. I open my shutter. I take a picture. My shutter closes. And this works great for static scenes, especially if I use a tripod. The problem comes when I have motion in my scene, especially fast motion. So here I have a, a cat jumping at a toy. I'm using my same camera. I'm going to open my shutter. Uh, it's going to stay open for my exposure time and then close. <clears throat> and of course, everybody knows what, uh, what's going to result is that in areas where there's a lot of motion, I get a blurry picture. And this is not very nice. However, in areas where nothing moved, in static portions of my scene, I have a really nice high spatial resolution. So I have, to, I have this, this uh, conundrum. And we really see this in a high speed camera. Right? So here, I'm going to try to take a video on a budget. So I'm a grad student. I need to work on my budget. Um, I have 30 million voxels that I can use any way I want. And one way is to take uh, what I just shown. Uh, what I have just shown, a high, speed, a high spatial resolution image at 30 frames per second. But if I want a high temporal resolution image, so a high speed camera at 1,000 frames per second, my spatial resolution suffers. And as I increase my frames per second, uh, I have light throughput issues. <clears throat> so we're going to try to avoid that using computational imaging. And we're going to do that by the introduction of this optical coding block in our diagram, or in, in, our, in our motion model. And if my optical coding is a linear operator, and I just take linear measurements, I can write this very nicely as a matrix uh, multiplication problem, where my observation y as a vector is nothing more than a linear combination of my real scene x uh, that's operated on by my uh, coding block. And for this camera, the flutter shutter video camera, this is a very simple uh, operation. It's just going to be coded exposure. I'm going to open and close my shutter uh, as I take my picture. So uh, unfortunately, there's a small resolution problem here. Um, so other uh, techniques that have been used include uh, spatial multiplexing, such as a single pixel camera. And you're going to hear uh, more about how to use this or use a single pixel camera for movies in the next talk. Uh, but this is a complex hardware. And you, but you get full control of that A matrix. Anything you want to do, you can achieve with the single pixel camera. Um, you could also do per pixel shutter control, which is implemented on an LCOS uh, liquid crystal on silicon mirror. And it gives you per pixel coded exposure. Uh, you could also use a, a per pixel sensor control, which is directly implementable, implementable on CMOS camera architecture which you might have in your cell phones, in your pocket, or this being Seattle, in your jacket pocket. Um, and this, uh, because it's going to be directly implemented on, on CMOS, it's a single bump per pixel per frame. And what we want to do is, is something uh, a little more simple. And it's global shutter control. So I'm going to, to open and close my shutter throughout my integration time. And what you may notice is that as we've been advancing, the complexity of the hardware modification has decreased. Unfortunately, this also means that my control of the A matrix has decreased, but it's something that we're going to have to live with. So again, here's my, uh, my recovery model. 
So given y and a, I want to find x, uh, or some x estimate of x. But this is severely under constrained, where uh, the number of measurements y is far less than the number of, of true elements n. So in order to recover my video, I'm going to have to introduce uh, video priors to help guide my reconstruction. And I'm sorry for the, the darkness here. And various scene uh, assumptions have been used to influence which priors we use. If I have a periodic or quasi-periodic scene uh, encoded strobing, they've shown that we can get 80x uh, compression. If my, uh, my scene obeys a linear dynamical system, then I can get 20 to 50x compression. If I have linear motion with known velocity, then uh, the flutter shutter camera, uh, which is our, the uh, antecedent of our, of our work, has been used to recover de-blur images. But for a more general class of motion that doesn't have these, these assumptions, uh, some notable works shown here, uh, we're, in, we're a little bit more limited to 6 to 16x compression. So what the, the video priors that I'm going to use are twofold. So I'm going to assume that I have uh, uh, two classes. If my scene motion is locally linear, so in small patches I can approximate motion as linear motion, uh, and this is true, I'm going to use a union of subspaces. If I have general motion, uh, then I'm going to use a different reconstruction based on TV minimization. So here's a video of the Lena image. It may not look like a video, uh, but it is a video, but it's moving with zero velocity. So if I were to look at a patch of this video, an 18 by 18 by 24 patch, as it evolves in time, and I were to look at any XY pixel and plot its intensity over time, I would notice that it doesn't change. Another way to show that is I'm going to look at the XT or the YT slice, XT slice, YT slice, whichever you prefer. And we're going to notice that it's completely flat. And what this uh, suggests is that these patches actually lie on a subspace. And that if I were to learn the subspace of patches with zero velocity, then I could recover this. And so that's what I do. Uh, if instead the Lena image moves down at one frame or one pixel per frame, and I look at my video cube, that same patch of the eye, I notice that all the pixels are still following the same motion, but the angle has changed, which uh, implies that I have a different subspace. So I learned that too. And in fact, I actually learned this, I learned 521 different velocities. Uh, so at 40 angles and 13 speeds, up to about two pixels per frame. And so if I have a high speed video, I can approximate it using the subspace. And also, what this means is that my high dimensional patch, 18 by 18 by 24, can really be expressed using a, a, lower di a low dimensional subspace, which is going to be incredibly important for compressive sensing. So <clears throat> if I take my high speed video and I apply a linear operator, which is exactly what my A matrix is, I get another subspace. I get, so I go from a high speed subspace to a low speed subspace. And this is where we want to be. So I have an observation patch. Again, this is all patch-based. So I take little patches, and then I uh, overlap them and average them at the end. So I take my patch, uh, I project to the nearest point in the subspace, get the coefficients, I bring them back to the high-speed subspace, and get my approximation. So <clears throat> uh, really, the, the only challenge is making sure that we're hitting kind of the right point, the nearest point. And so here, for some, some unknown velocity that's not part of those uh, 521 that I know, uh, I show a sim you know, here's a simple reconstruction. And we notice that the error between our estimate and the, the ground truth is a minimum at the nearest point. And even if, it's, uh, even if there's a little bit of noise or a slight perturbation, we're in the right neighborhood. So our reconstruction should, be, uh, should look good. And so that's what we have here. Here's that that whole video, which I've taken patches out of that are overlapping, uh, moving at that unknown speed, and the reconstruction on the right. And so I am able to recover this with a peak signal noise ratio of about 35.5 dB. But not all scenes follow this locally linear uh, video assumption that I have. So if 
for a more general class of scenes, we notice, uh, one, uh, we notice a couple of things. Videos, like images, have a sparse distribution of their gradients. And we know that uh, the TV uh, norm has been used to help in image deep blurring, so in a 2D case. So we want to extend that to 3D. Um, unfortunately, we, at the time that we were doing this, we, didn't, we couldn't find a really nice, fast uh, uh, 3D TV minimizer. So we ended up having to, uh, we ended up using a, a package in MATLAB, and then we did this on XT slices. So we would, so for each slice, we would reconstruct using the, the TV minimizer, and then evolve in space, and then add these together. Um, so before I show any of the, uh, before I show the experimental results, here are a couple more simulations. Um, if I ha here I have a, a advertisement moving to the right. Uh, again, X is ground truth, or left is ground truth, right is our reconstruction. Um, and here we're able to, to recover with a, a peak signal noise ratio of about 40.6 dB. For a more general motion such as this scene where we have a dancer who's about to clap and a chalk, dust is form a chalk cloud is formed, uh, and recover with my uh, TV minimizer. And we notice that the, uh, the peak signal noise ratio is a little bit lower, it's 28.7. And this is suggestive of the fact that uh, in our linear motion model, we have a richness of the scene that we're taking advantage of. And here we have a more general scene. So the flutter shutter video camera, FSVC, can be directly implemented on uh, machine vision cameras. So in our lab, we have a Flea 3, uh, a grayscale Flea 3 camera from Point Gray. And we implemented uh, our very simple setup, and we're operating at about 8 frames per second due to some inherent limitations of the camera. And what we have here on the left is four observed frames. So I'm going to take an uh, observed frame patch, 18 by 18 by 4, and recover a video uh, patch, which would be 18 by 18 by 24. If they overlap, I average them. So here's my video, and here's a close-up. So we see that our, uh, the first uh, bit of the word lollipops is uh, blurred, and if this were a low-speed camera, this entire thing would be blurred. And as we evolve in time, all of the letters remain blurred. And so here's our reconstruction, and a zoomed-in version of the reconstruction. So again, we've gone from four frames, uh, uh, four low-speed frames, and recovered 24 high-speed frames. And of course, we can do this uh, in multiple chunks of four. So if we took a, a longer video, we could recover a, a much longer video. <clears throat> so kind of in conclusion to wrap up, what we want to notice is that global shutter control suffices for high-speed video recovery. And what this really means for us is that as we've been able to reduce the hardware complexity from some of the, uh, some of the or first papers, uh, we've been able to reduce the complexity at only a uh, minor cost in quality, but this camera, our camera, is much uh, easier to implement on existing uh, camera architectures. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. So the uh, the original simulations did include noise, um, and and the the camera is and there's a there's a plot in the paper. The camera is fairly robust to additive Gaussian noise. I mean that's that's what we simulated anyway. And, and they, they work, they find, the, uh, they find the correct subspace up to, I think it's like 0.01, a standard deviation of 0.01 on 0 to 1 scale. Yep. So there seems to be two things going on here. One is the interpolation in time, mm -hmm. the, the other one is the blurring. Right. Are these happening simultaneously in your formulation? Uh, yes. So, uh, the, the recovery is, is simultaneous, and what, what uh, we do is, as we, so in our first case, the linear, uh, locally linear model, we're observing uh, our database of high-speed patches 
using the same co coded exposure. So we're blurring this database that we have to generate our low-speed subspace. So when we project onto that subspace and, and recover, we're actually taking care of that deblurring and interpolation all at once. And when we do the TV uh, reconstruction, it's a, a similar thing as in that we handle both of them at the same time. I didn't show the, the steps for, for brevity. Oh, right here, sorry. So mm -hmm. Ah, excellent question. Sorry for not making that clear. Um, no, we don't. We do not need to know the motion direction, and that's a terrible way to go about doing this. So, in the uh, maybe some other time, um, there it goes. Hey, got very lucky. So, what we do is we in the local model we actually exhaustively search over the database, and because this is formulated as a, as a matrix recovery, uh, it's, it's very low cost to search all of our patches. It, it actually takes longer to load the data into memory than it does to search. So we search exhaustively over all 521 different velocities and find the, re, the estimate whose uh, observation error is the lowest. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the observation um, A right here takes our database, which is very large. I mean, so it's high dimensional. It's uh, 18 by 18 by 24 dimensional. It's independent from the picture itself. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so it's independent of the picture itself. And, and it, it searches, and, and each patch is uh, found individually. So in the, in the reconstruction results, um, which this is not happy to go through, you'll notice that there are some parts that are static and, and the, the thing moves. So for those patches that are static, it finds that the appropriate velocity to pick is zero. And for the, other, for the motion, it, it finds the correct velocity. I think there's one more question. Let's just take one more. Yep. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, so. We are, we are working on, on that part right now. So for the, for the locally linear, uh, for the locally linear model, we need to step back one level because right now we're only modeling uh, without occlusions in our, in our database. And for the, for the more general motion for TV, it just turns out that the camera, the way that we implemented it, we didn't use a ferroelectric shutter and our, our uh, uh, frame rate was very low and I, was unable to move things that fit the, the model. So at eight frames per second, I found it very hard to move things in any sort of pattern that wasn't like jumping completely outside of the frame. That was a, a personal experience limitation, I think. Okay, let's thank uh, Jason again. Okay. Um, so you just heard Jason tell you about how to take a low speed video camera, say something like a 30 frames per second camera, and convert it to a high-speed camera, something like a 200 frames per second camera. And the idea was that uh, during each exposure of this low-speed camera, you introduce a temporal code, and this temporal code allows you to convert this uh, low temporal resolution camera into a high temporal resolution camera. Uh, I'm going to talk about something complementary. Uh, here, we are going to talk about cameras which are very poor spatial resolution. So we have very few pixels in these cameras. And we are going to introduce spatial masks, spatial uh, multiplex, uh, multiplexing masks that allow us to convert a camera that has low spatial resolution into something that has high spatial resolution. And we are going to call these cameras broadly as spatial multiplexing cameras. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is some of the basic trade-offs that come about in the context of these cameras. And I'm going to derive a video compressor sensing algorithm that works for these spatial multiplexing cameras. So what are spatial multiplexing cameras? I think uh, the example that I'm going to use for the rest of the talk is a single pixel camera. As its name suggests, the single pixel camera has a single um, a detector, a single photodiode that's due to some wavelength of interest. Uh, and to continue something that's been going on all this talk, here's my quote. Uh, Jason just mentioned that we have a resolution problem. And clearly with a single pixel, we do have a resolution problem uh, when we deal with single, uh, with single pixel cameras. So the question is, how do we circumvent this uh, resolution problem? The idea is we introduce 
a spatial light modulator. And this particular spatial light modulator we introduce is a digital micro mirror device. So the uh, camera works as follows. Light from a scene is projected on, not to the sensor, but to this digital micro mirror device. At each pixel of this micro mirror device, you have a tiny mirror, which can be in one of two states. When it's white, the light from that pixel goes towards the photo detector, and when it's black, the light is just discarded. So what we end up getting for any particular pattern on, those, on, the, on the mirrors is that the photo detector sums up all the pixels that are white. So what we get is a linear measurement of the scene, and by flipping through random combinations of these mirrors, what we can end up get is different sets of linear combinations of uh, the pixels in the scene, or different linear measurements of the scene. Now once we obtain enough linear measurements, we can invert to obtain the scene either using least square techniques or more um, compressive recovery techniques. Right? Um, I think the main uh, reason why the, the, this camera makes sense when uh, we are sensing in non-visible wavelengths. Typically in many wa uh, wavelength bands in short wave infrared and medium wave infrared, uh, sensing materials are costly. As a consequence, it's very difficult to build sensor arrays of, of the resolution that we care about. So instead, the single pixel camera tackles that by putting a single sensing element at the resolution we're interested, however, gives us spatial resolution by introducing a light modulator in the optical pathway. The problem is that at any time instant, we get exactly one measurement. And if you have to, if you need multiple measurements to recover a scene, we need to integrate over time. We need to accumulate measurements over time to recover the scene. And this somehow makes the assumption that the scene is static over a small duration of time. Um, and if then the scene is static, if the scene is not static or not slowly moving over a small duration of time, what ends up happening is that every measurement is of a slightly different scene. And the question is, how does this, what do, how does this affect our recovery algorithm? How does it affect our recovery process when you're interested in sensing images and uh, videos? And that's what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of the talk. So let's do a simple thought experiment. We start off with a time-varying scene. In this particular scene, you have two vehicles that are just crossing each other. I'm going to sense the scene with a single pixel camera. I'm, at every time instant, I'm going to measure exactly one measurement. And recall that as I'm sensing measurements, the scene is slowly changing uh, during this uh, measurement process. So I'm going to take a window of W measurements. I'm going to take W, W is the number of measurements I'm going to take. And given the W measurements, I'm going to recover the scene as though it were a static scene. So I'm going to forget the fact that things are moving, take W measurements, and try to recover the scene as though it's a single static image. Uh, the question is, let's see what happens when we do this process. To answer this question, we need to actually look at different time scales. Suppose I take very few measurements. Say W is small. If W were small, then I'm taking very few measurements. Therefore, the time window over which I took these measurements is small. If the time window is small, it means things have moved very little, and therefore I expect to get very little motion blur. However, because of the fact that I have very few measurements, I end up getting very poor reconstruction. Clearly, if I'm sensing a high resolution scene, you need a lot more measurements, and you do not get that by taking very few measurements. At the other end, if we take a lot of measurements, say we take, we take uh, measurements over a long window of time, we do end up getting a lot of measurements, so we can go ahead and try to recover the scene at very high spatial resolution. However, because our W is large, it means the window of time over which we took these measurements is also going to be large. And as a consequence, what ends up happening is there's tremendous motion blur uh, in our recovered result. And I think this trade-off is fundamental to almost all video cameras. It's a basic trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution at which we uh, sense the scene. In the context of a single pixel camera, we end up getting, this resolution is also tied to the number of measurements that we take. So at one end, we have very low spatial resolution, but we also have higher temporal resolution. And at the other end, when we take a lot of measurements, we have very high spatial resolution, but much poorer temporal resolution. There is a sweet spot. Unfortunately, the sweet spot gives us very poor, both temporal resolution and also the reconstruction error is very high. Right. What we'd ideally like to have is that that sweet spot to be as low as possible so that we get good quality uh, recovered image and to be as to my right as possible so that we get good temporal resolution. So that's what we are aiming for. And the question is, can we, how do we go about uh, getting better trade-off um, from a device such as um, this? Uh, I, I, uh, another point to be made here is that the sweet spot moves is dependent on the scene. If you have faster moving object, it moves 
to its right, and if you have slow moving object, it moves to the left, and so on. But for just for this particular, uh, since I've fixed my scene, we can continue with this particular um, example. So the question is, how do you move the sweet spot low, and how do you move it to the right? Right. So that gives us better temporal resolution and gives us higher quality uh, imagery. The answer lies in the fact that we are trying to recover a single image at a time. Uh, videos are clearly more redundant than that. that is, and this is clearly, um, and we all know this due to success of uh, video compression literature. And the idea is that if you need to exploit motion in the scene, we need to do things like motion estimation and motion compensation, things that state-of-the-art compression algorithms do to somehow reduce the number of degrees in the freedom and not have to solve for individual frames at a time. Um, can we do this? The problem, it turns out, is not as simple. In the, in, the, in the case of compression, we have access to the frames of the video. So we can compute motion. We can do all sorts of fancy motion compensation and estimation techniques. However, in the context of sensing, this is not as easy because we do not have access to the frames of the video. Right? Um, we do have an initial estimate. Right? We do have an initial estimate that comes about from there. What happens if you use this initial estimate to recover, read, to recover motion and try to do something with that? Um, with that. It turns out that because our initial estimate was very poor, our motion estimates are poor as well. Um, so this is the chicken and egg problem that we need to solve. We need to get very good motion estimates if we want to recover good estimates of the scene. However, to get good estimates of, the, uh, to get good estimates of motion, we need, to have, um, we need to have the scene at a good, nice, um, reconstruct in a very nice way. And this chicken and egg problem is something that is not easily broken when we do this kind of naive uh, reconstruction techniques. I'm going to skip over a lot of details here, but let me work, work through the intuition of um, how we get through the solution. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that when we have blur in the scene, blur reduces the amount of sparse structures in the scene. And compressor sensing, all of compressor sensing techniques, um, traditionally have relied on sparse approximation on, and on sparse signal models uh, and so on. So maybe the first thing to acknowledge is that sparse approximation algorithms do not necessarily work well when you have motion blurred things. And so why not try something simpler, just simple least square recovery? So I have a linear set of equations. I'm just going to invert it without any sparse priors. Um, this is not easy. This is, you could do this, but the problem is this not, this doesn't give you any better trade-offs because we, have a, we are sensing a scene with a high spatial resolution. To get enough compressive measurements, we'll have to wait a long amount of time. And that means you're going to get very poor uh, temporal resolution and a lot of motion blur. So the next idea is we are going to do least square recovery, but not on the scene at its full spatial resolution, but we are going to artificially reduce the resolution of the scene. We are going to sense the scene at a lower spatial resolution. And the idea here is that if we have a lower spatial resolution, we have a lower dimensional problem. A lower dimensional problem means we need lesser number of linear measurements. And if you have lesser number of measurements, it means we are going to take measurements over a smaller window of time, which means you're going to get a higher temporal resolution. Uh, can we just do both of these and get away with it? The answer is still no. We cannot use random matrices that have traditionally been the focus of compressor sensing um, in compressing. The problem is random matrices are ill-conditioned. Uh, if you take a large random matrix, say a Gaussian matrix, its singular values decay linearly, which means when you use it for linear recovery, al in the, when you use it with linear recovery algorithms, you get a um, huge amount of noise amplification. And the details of this are in the paper, and there are a lot of uh, uh, crappy images there if you're interested in uh, looking at. Um, the answer lies in something that was mentioned by Dave Brady yesterday. We need to use uh, matrices, we need to use a class of matrices that are called Hadamard matrices. Now, Hadamard matrices, and this is work that goes back almost half a century to a century back, um, are orthogonal, which means the singular values are flat. There's no noise amplification. Um, but orthogonality is not all that we require. Clearly, an identity matrix provides orthogonality. We need something else. We need maximum light throughput. And Hadamard matrices provide that in the context of sensing matrices. Uh, what are sensing matrices? These are matrices that do not amplify light. They're matrices whose entries are bounded by uh, identity. They take values between minus 1 and plus 1. And among the space of those matrices, Hadamard is optimal for least square recovery. So what happens if we now use Hadamard matrices, but at a lower spatial resolution? The trade-off that we get, the sweet spot, now moves both down and to the right. So we have gotten, we have gotten better reconstruction. At the same time, we have also enabled a higher temporal resolution. 
right? So we know that's the estimate that we get. But to obtain this estimate, we had to sacrifice spatial resolution, and that's what we are after. We want to recover the scene at full spatial resolution. And the trade-off that Hadamard gives is sort of strange. If you want to increase the spatial resolution, you necessarily have to increase the temporal resolution because you're using least square technique. So at the sweet spot, you get a good result, but at a low spatial resolution, if you try to increase the spatial resolution, immediately motion blur creeps in, and then you get um, images that are no longer acceptable. What we would like to have is all the properties that Haramad provides, um, a great initial reconstruction at a lower spatial resolution with high, temp um, with high temporal resolution, but nonetheless, we would like to keep the properties of random matrices, which are they enable, they guarantee um, L1 recovery with a sparse prior. Um, they, provide, um, they provide reconstructions of scene at full spatial resolution. And what we would like to have are measurement matrices that guarantee both of these properties simultaneously. The question is, how do we go about building such measurement matrices? And we, we have a solution, and it's a simple solution. We call them dual scale sensing matrices. Um, here's how we go about doing this. We start off with a row of the Haramar matrix. So this is just a single row of the Haramar matrix shaped into, say, a 32 by 32 block. We upsample this to a final resolution, and on this, by nearest neighbor upsampling, uh, once we upsample it, we add a random high frequency component to this, and take the sum of this to obtain this measurement vector. And the idea is that this random component is created in a very specific way. It's made so that when you downsample this matrix, you end up with the row of the Hadamard matrix that you started off with. Right? So what, what does this matrix guarantee? It has all the properties of Hadamard at the lower spatial resolution. Nonetheless, it has high frequency content that we'll eventually use in a compressive uh, recovery technique. So the patterns that we put on the mirror, uh, put on the mirror of our uh, single pixel camera, look like that. You can see that there is, um, there is a multi-scale structure to that. You do see the low frequency Hadamard blocks. In this case, it's scrambled, that's why it doesn't look like that. And on top of that, there is a high frequency, sort of a noise speckle um, thrown on top. And that comes about because of creating matrices that have the, uh, with this kind of uh, structure. And this measurement matrix allows us uh, to derive a video compressor sensing algorithm that breaks the chicken and egg problem that I mentioned earlier. So how do you go about doing that? First, we may, may, may obtain compressor measurements using these dual scale matrices. Once we get these compressor measurements, we can take any unit of W measurements where W is chosen by the resolution of the Hadamard matrix that we use to recover an initial low resolution estimate of the scene. Right? Uh, so this is very fast. All we do is take W measurements, apply inverse Hadamard transform, and we obtain those results. Now once we have these results, we can now go ahead and run our favorite motion estimation algorithm. In this particular case, an optical flow, optical flow algorithm. And now the motion estimates are much better. Right? And if, once we have these motion estimates, we can go ahead and solve for the entire video all over again, however, now with motion constraints thrown on top. And what does motion really, where does motion help us? So imagine two frames of a video. If you know that certain pixels in one frame appeared in the second frame, then you can use that as constraint to reduce the number of independent uh, variables that we have. So clearly, what, what, where motion helps us is we can take a video where things are moving and sort of register things so that we are now, it's almost like sensing a static image. And sensing a static image is something that we can do very well with a single pixel camera. All we need to do is get enough measurements and we can recover the scene uh, very well. So here is a quick uh, simulation result. So what you see here is the ground truth. On, the, on, on your left, the initial reconstruction, but now upsampled by cubic um, in the middle. And you can already see that that's very good. But once you add motion constraints on top and solve for the video all over again, you end up with the final result that looks um, even better. Um, so we implemented this on the lab setup that we have. So this is a single pixel camera setup that we have in the lab. This is the target that we use is a metronome with uh, object mounted on it. Uh, the particular photodiode we use was an in-gas photodetector. This senses in short wave infrared. We are sampling at about 10 kilohertz. So for every second, we are getting 10,000 compressor measurements. And we are aiming to recover a scene that had, say, a spatial resolution of 128 by 128. So we are looking at a compression of about 61, um, 61x. Here's a recovered result. 
top row you see the initial estimate that we get of doing this uh, the Hadamard inverse on windows of our matrix this is the initial estimate that we get. Once we estimate motion across those frames and rerun our video recovery algorithm, you get the bottom estimate. There's a video of um, the recovered uh, result. Just to compare with what happens when you do, uh, when you use just purely random codes and try to get an initial estimate, these are the frames that you get um, on real data, the top row. So you just take pure random measurements and take blocks of um, compressed measurements and try to do a linear recovery. And in contrast, even for fast moving object, we get much better uh, results. And I think this shows the power of both the measurement matrices that we use, which could provide an initial estimate, as well as the power of optical flow based um, uh, recovery that really helps both denoise but also reduce the number of degrees of freedom and provide uh, better um, image reconstruction. So the key, key ingredients, there are basically two key in ingredients in this particular algorithm. The first is the design of these novel measurement matrices that have these dual scale structure. And this somehow helps us to recover, get a very good estimate of the initial scene. And when we couple it with state of the art motion models that video compression algorithms use, we get uh, very high uh, quality recovered results. This is one of the first, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, practical al uh, video recovery algorithm that works for the single pixel camera. And I think uh, at the heart of this is uh, it's acknowledging the fact that the scene actually changes during the measurement process between every consecutive measurement. And there's been a lot of work in this area, including many that are in which I have co-authored, where we just ignore this and simulate with 30 frames per second video, and that clearly doesn't um, reproduce the kind of uh, real data that, uh, the kind of real data um, behavior that happens when we use a single pixel camera. Uh, limitations, so we do need to know, have some idea of what the speed of object motion, or at least the speed of objects in the scene, because that tells us where the sweet spot occurs and what the, what the size of the Hadamard matrix needs to be. Uh, we could, of course, we are looking into multi-scale construction that can uh, sort of circumvent this where we do not need this prior knowledge. Uh, another assumption that we are making is that the motion is revealed at the low resolution estimate. If we have very fine structures, say like wires moving about, we do not detect it in the low resolution estimate and that's something that uh, it's not clear how to go about um, doing that. And finally, everything depends on how well we do motion estimation. So currently we are just using off-the-shelf optical flow algorithms that do pairwise optical flow computations, but clearly there's a lot of room for improvement here. We can definitely do multi-frame optical flow to really make the motion estimate uh, more robust. And um, a lot of this takes in the order of minutes to recover. Clearly we could do a lot better there as well in terms of better recovery algorithms. I'll stop here, thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Requirements for individual samples? So we, like sure. uh, so we do get a lot of light in because at every time instant we're getting half the light in the scene end, right? So in that sense, because spatial multiplexing really helps us um, um, handle low light. Uh, in, in fact, if you uh, most of these, most of the real data was collected in what you would call low light uh, situations, so it works reasonably well. There was another question. Yeah. Why I might want to use this sensor? Uh, I mean, with a standard video camera, I can get very high video rates, pretty good spatial resolution. So why would I want to do this? Great question. The question is, why would you want to use the sensor? Clearly, we've gone into a lot of effort in terms of building this hardware and so on. And my cell phone camera, which I don't have on me, provides much better video quality than this. So what's where's the place for this particular uh, technology? I think the answer comes about when you're sensing a non-visible spectrum. So think of sensing, uh, say, a megapixel video at 30 frames per second in infrared, or in, say, shortwave or medium infrared. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, VGA infrared cameras cost upwards of fifty to $100,000. And I'm not sure if there are megapixel uh, video cameras that sense in infrared. And that's exactly where this technology finds its niche. It's in, and it's generally true of compressor sensing as well. Sensing has to be costly if you want to make, uh, if it's useful. And here, the cost comes about because in gas, uh, building sensor arrays using in gas is extremely costly. While in the case of single pixel camera, we need exactly one photo detector, 200 bucks in Tor Labs, and we have this setup. So if I may follow up, building on the question that came before, when you're talking about sensing in the infrared, you really have to deal with a lot more noise. 
Sure. Now, that's not in the focus of what you just talked about. So have, have you considered that possibility that this may in fact be a limiting factor for the kinds of applications that you're thinking about using? So you're talking about noise in the uh, just, uh, during a measurement process? Uh, we, so we have not done a complete analysis in terms of looking at uh, noise, but I, I can show you results. We've controlled the amount of illumination in the scene, like reduced illumination by a fourth and so on, and it works reasonably well. But to answer your question, we have not done a systematic study of that, but it's something that definitely works. One last question. So for some of the other groups that have worked in hybrid compressive sensing, what we all have to directly see on the business side so the uh, question is, we know that videos have some sort of subspace structures to it. Am I trying to exploit them in some sense? I think that I think at the heart of it is. Um, well, I'm not directly exploiting those, those kinds of uh, models because I, all I'm using is the, f oh, yes and no. Yes, in a sense, I'm assuming that the video is sort of band limited. Otherwise, the aliasing that happens because of introducing the um, high frequency pattern will, will give very poor initial results. So in some sense, I'm assuming that the video is, is uh, not too, um, I think this will not work on edge images if I think that, that should answer your question. Okay, let's thank Ashwin again. The last talk of the session is uh, titled uh, Calibration Free Rolling Shutter Removal, and Matthias Grunman will present. Thank you. Hey, my name is Matthias, and I will be presenting joint work with uh, Vivek, Daniel, and Irfan about calibration free rolling shutter removal in video. So to motivate the problem, let's look at a following example. So this is a video that we've taken from a mobile Android phone uh, that we deliberately have been uh, shaken quite a bit. And what I want to point out here is that you see, due to the, no, uh, uh, due to the uh, nature of the sensor, that you see non-rigid distortions in this video that go beyond what, uh, what you would consider uh, average camera shake. And our goal is basically to undistort and undo this camera shake. So again, on top is the uh, original shaky video, and at the bottom is our calibrated result. And you see it's still a video because when you look at the person walking up on, the, uh, up on that little bridge. And one um, ingredient of our technique is, is basically that it's completely calibration free, or that it also doesn't uh, assume any knowledge about the camera. So our goal here is to come up with a novel technique that allows rolling shutter removal in casual web video. And uh, in order to do this, it needs to be calibration free, no knowledge about the camera. It needs to be also fully automatic. So beyond the simple click of a button by a user, uh, there, there should be no further user interaction involved. We achieve this by proposing a novel mixture model of homographies. And we evaluate that compared to uh, previous approaches by conducting a, a user study comparing against six other authors. And uh, I will close the talk by showing you uh, that our uh, technique is basically applicable to real-time performance and show you a little live uh, implementation that is on YouTube. So the uh, nature of rolling shutter stems from that there are two kinds of sensors. So the classical sensor, like a CCD sensor, uses a global shutter. It reads out and captures the image at one instant in time. However, if you have a rolling shutter uh, sensor, like for example a CMOS sensor that you find in most uh, mobile phones, but even in high-end cameras like the RED camera, the image is read at one scan line at a time. And if, if your motion model does not account for this difference in the capturing process, you basically do poorly. So to motivate this, let's look at the following example. So this is a rolling shutter video courtesy of uh, Baker et al. in CPR 2010, and it's uh, taken from a helicopter with a rolling shutter camera, and you see these wobble distortions. And now if we just apply the, our previous video stabilization approach that just uses a global uh, motion uh, model, then you basically see that it stabilizes the video, so it takes out some of the shake of the helicopter, but the wobble distortions are still there. So the, the issue basically stems from the fact that 
the motion model is now, in the case of a rolling shutter, not global with respect to the frame, but varies across the scan line. So you need to come up with a motion model that is basically dynamic and can adapt to that nature and that varies over the scan lines. What do I mean by motion model? So in our case, uh, we start by uh, extracting feature points and, uh, for example, KLT feature points and then just tracking them. So they're basically you measure uh, for a, a bunch of corners their displacement with respect to the previous frame. And now, and now what we try to do <laughs> <laughs> now what we try to do is basically fit a parametric motion model to this discrete set uh, of, of tracked feature points so that you basically can map every point of the image to its corresponding point in the previous image. And so this can induce a warp so that you can effectively then uh, undistort uh, the rolling shutter motion. Now, how does this uh, motion estimation work? Uh, in this case, I show three different frames and uh, I indicate the nature of the rolling shutter by basically uh, displacing the capture time of the uh, scan line, so that's why you get this little uh, slanted line. Now, if you assume for a moment that you would have an uh, ordinary uh, global shutter. In a, in a global shutter, what you basically have is, in case you have a calibrated camera matrix where uh, the camera matrix is known, then the uh, camera matrix is uh, determined by the intrinsic parameters and the rotation and translation uh, of the camera at the instant you captured that frame. And in case you use a 2D uh, motion model, so you look at a, a feature match X and Y, you basically have a mapping between X and Y. And for example, in 2D, if you assume that there's no translation, then the camera matrix is invertible, and you have this uh, relationship between X and Y by, by assuming that X and Y uh, image the same uh, or the identical 3D point of the scene. Now, in case you have a rolling shutter model, uh, this changes a bit. Uh, now, the issue here is that the uh, rotation matrices are not uh, constant with respect to the frames anymore, but they actually change across the scan line. So this is indicated by this uh, dependency of the rotation matrix on the scan line of X, SX, and then also the scan line of Y, SY. And we, we now try to uh, basically come up with a, a little simplified model that describes this relationship. So what we need is, of course, we need a higher degree of freedom model, higher degree of freedom model compared to, for example, uh, homography with eight degrees of freedom. So the first step that we can do if we take the uh, relationship from the previous slide is we can basically lump the five degrees of freedom of the intrinsic camera matrix K and the three degrees of freedom of the rotation together in this uh, uh, homography, which is just a, a linear three by three transform. And this homography still depends, of course, uh, on the scan line of X, and it also depends, the second one, on the scan line of Y. And now we make an important simplification to make this problem tractable. What we will do is we will drop the dependency on Y. So we basically assume that all points in uh, one scan line get mapped to another scan line in the other frame. This simplification is, of course, not always true, right? In case you have heavy rotation or you have heavy scale between the two frames, it is violated. But in video, in general, these changes are rather small. So we found that this simplification is still applicable. So then what you basically have is that... <laughs> what you basically have <laughs> is you have one homography that describes the mapping between X and Y, but this homography depends on the scan line of X. Now, in order to estimate uh, this, this model, you can imagine you would need to estimate one homography for every scan line. And of course, you don't have that many feature points. So uh, to simplify this, what we do is instead of estimating one homography for every scan line, we discretize the image into multiple blocks and we will estimate one homography per block. Now, you see, if I would just uh, estimate them independently, you would get these discontinuities between blocks and uh, the warp would look weird. So instead what we do is we simply say that the homography is a mixture of these base homographies that we estimate for every block with linear weights that only depend on the scan line of the feature point. And these weights are, are, are known a priori, you can just compute them. Uh, what we do is we basically use Gaussian weights. Uh, so these weights are centered around the midpoint of each block. 
and they basically vote for each uh, feature point how much they influence it. And the nice thing about this is now you have a linear model describing uh, the, the, the nature of rolling shutter, and you still can like e estimate it with some kind of extended DLT. Everything is linear. Uh, some implementation details, we use 10 blocks across the image. We use a sigma for the Gaussian weight that is 10% of the frame height. And uh, one thing you need to do is you need to add a regularizer because if one of the blocks has very few features, it becomes numerically unstable. Uh, and in order to discount foreground motions, what we do is we embed this into an iterative reweighted least square scheme. And the nice thing about this is, in, like in the previous example, there was a car then driving uh, through the scene later on, and you, you see we can nicely discount this foreground motion. If you don't do that, you basically get a warp that would follow the foreground motion and, and it would look weird over time. Um, back to the original uh, video from the helicopter. Now if I take this video and I just apply the motion model I, I just described, I can basically nicely undo uh, the rolling shutter distortions. So it can adapt to it. And you also see like the little input sign dancing around. This is the, the foreground uh, or the iterative free weightly square discounting it. Um, I picked two previous approaches to compare here uh, just very quickly. Uh, basically, Forsen and Ringerby is a, is a visual odometry approach which uh, assumes a fixed camera matrix that has been calibrated. And then in, instead of uh, homographies estimated over blocks, they basically assume that this rotation matrices are smoothly varying uh, across the capturing process and they use spherical linear interpolation. Uh, Baker et al. from CVPR 2010 uses something similar to ours in the sense that they also have blocks and then they have uh, per block translations, and they integrate those. Now, the difference is if you do interpolation or integration, uh, what is important is you need to account for the interframe delay. The interframe delay is a little time between capturing the last scan line in a frame and then capturing the first scan line in the next frame. And this is important because if you use interpolation or integration, you have bounds, and, and you need to get that right. In our case, we don't, have, uh, we don't use uh, any of those, so it's, it's inherently calibration-free. Uh, we evaluated this uh, with a user study uh, based uh, on 54 participants comparing to six authors, and we basically showed everybody the original and then method A and method B, and we asked them to say which methods they preferred, if any, or the original. And the, the arrangement was randomized. Uh, and here's the, uh, some, some comparison that are not blind now anymore. So here, this is a Baker et al. approach. I should note, Baker can actually estimate the interframe delay uh, automatically from a video if it contains wobble. So it needs to be a rolling shutter distorted video. This is the Forsen and Ringerby approach here on the left, uh, which, which is a calibrated approach. So the interframe delay there is actually estimated in a lab with a pulse laser pose, uh, pulse, sorry. That is lying at all, uh, which, which uses some kind of interpolation of uh, affine transforms across the frame. Here we compare to the approach of Kapenko et al. It's a, a tech report in Stanford, uh, which is basically based on the uh, Force and Ringerby paper, but instead of estimating the rotation from the visual data, they use a gyroscope to uh, build in the mobile phone to basically read that out. Here we compare to our previous uh, work in CVPR 2011, and you've seen that before. And finally, we compare to uh, subspace video stabilization, which is a transaction of graphics last year. And uh, these are the, the plots for each uh, of the six authors that we compare to. Red basically indicates uh, they, uh, the users preferred our approach, blue uh, the, the approach of the other author, and then green uh, no preference, and you see that like in the majority of the cases, uh, users preferred uh, our uncalibrated approach uh, compared to others. Um, now I want to show some challenging examples that we obtained from YouTube, uh, Citizen Tube in particular. So uh, these are videos where Casual users just, you know, report live from scene. In this case, it was this jet crash in Virginia Beach just some weeks ago. And this person's, for example, riding on a bike. So you see these heavy wobble distortions, and uh, it's basically uh, hard to watch. 
Uh, this one is actually even more extreme. And it's, it's people that, that are excited, of course, in the moment. This is challenging because what you have is you have foreground motion, you have a lot of lack of texture, uh, you have these crazy motions in between where it shouldn't break down, uh, m you know, missing texture in the sky region. And the technique is, is kind of, can deal with a lot of the challenges. Okay, in the end, I want to show you uh, that this is applicable to uh, real-time uh, implementation. So uh, this is a little demo I captured from YouTube at youtube.com slash editor. Um, so we implemented the technique with the editor. Here is the, the helicopter video, and now if I basically click on stabilize, uh, it's doing stabilization and rolling shutter removal in real-time. Uh, another example. And if you want to try it out by yourself, it should be uh, available uh, end of next week. Yeah, and this uh, concludes my talk. Questions? Time for questions? Um, no, in general, <laughs> in general, what we use is a warp, so in the end of the day, uh, you will introduce some kind of blurriness on the pixel level, uh, but in the cases you have seen, actually, the resolution uh, was high enough that this shouldn't be a problem here. Um, on YouTube, we have these enhancements and the editor, uh, and uh, end of next week, you will be available to upload your, your rolling shutter video. I mean, we, the stabilizer is already in place, but it will basically account for the rolling shutter distortions as well as a demo. So, so you have to upload your video to YouTube? Right. Uh, okay. So the competitions happen on the client side or on the cloud? In YouTube, they happen on the cloud. Um, basically, the, the, the readout in, in the CMOS sensor is, is something we, we keep, uh, you know, given in this sense, and we just adapt to it. Uh, we don't design camera sensors. There are good reasons to do that. For example, I think there's actually like a pre-readout uh, in the CMOS sensor that uh, can uh, allow you to do exposure control, which you don't have at the CCD sensor, but um, that's, that's not really our expertise. So basically, uh, our video stabilization approach, or this is using our previous work, uh, basically does cropping. Uh, so we, we trade content for uh, motion stability. Alternatives are that you allow out-of-bound areas, in which case you would need to do some kind of motion in painting. Uh, we don't do that mainly because uh, you know, we need to produce the results fast, and motion painting takes a little while. So we, we use a simpler version where we just do cropping for stabilization. Yes, I see. Oh, what if you don't know if there's really shutter or not? Do you, do you have some way of detecting whether, in other words, do you apply this method to all videos, really shutter or not, or do you do some sort of branching? So basically, for the automatic version, it is uh, applied as applicable. So we have a technique that basically knows when to apply rolling shutter and when not. And that's based on metadata, or are you actually analyzing motion tracking data and decide whether or not? No, it's uh, completely blind because the metadata and video is not reliable. Uh, you know, you can get some from uh, MP4, but in general you don't know that, so it's, it's more general than that. Okay, there's nothing else, so let's thank all the three speakers again.